On the night of April 14, 1912, the RMS Titanic, the White Star Line's newest ocean liner, struck an iceberg on the starboard side, puncturing six of the 16 watertight compartments from the four feet tank, three holds, boiler room number six, and a tear into the coal bunker for boiler room number five. At 1240, on April 15, 1912, the evacuation order was made by Captain Smith to First Officer William Murdoch and Second Officer Charles Lightoller, asking the women and children to be loaded into the boats. At 1.05 a.m., Lifeboat 1, an emergency cutter lifeboat, was launched with 12 people on board. Seven crew members and five first-class passengers were 10 men and two women. The notable passengers on board Lifeboat 1 were Sir Cosmo Duff Gordon, his wife Lucille Duff Gordon, and their secretary, Laura Franconelli. At 2.20 a.m., Titanic goes under, two hours and 40 minutes after striking an iceberg, stranding 1,500 passengers to die in the freezing North Atlantic Ocean. On board Lifeboat 1, neither the crew or passengers went back to rescue the ones stranded in the water due to fears of being swamped. Lifeboat 1 had a capacity of only 12 people on board with a maximum of 40. But why? So to further understand the story, we must look back at the lifeboat that they actually did board it on, which is lifeboat number one. Now this is a Histobrick model, which actually is complete with 12 minifigures and also the lifeboat itself. I will leave a link down in the description box below for you guys to check out as well and also purchase one of your own as well. Lifeboat one or emergency cutter one is located at the starboard side bridge wing. It is pre-swung out and ready in case of an event for example, a man overboard situation. Another lifeboat, which is emergency cutter number two, is also swung out and ready in case of an emergency, which is located on the port side of the Titanic. The only time it was retracted back was when the Titanic was in Southampton at the start of her maiden voyage. The lifeboat is filled with six oars, a lighted oil lantern, water, food, and life jackets inside. The lifeboat was first constructed at Harlan and Wolf at Queen's Yard in Belfast at the same time the Titanic and Olympic were constructed. They were designed with a double-ended bow as it reduces the risk that it would be flooded by the following sea. Another feature consists airtight copper tanks within the boat's side to provide buoyancy. The capacity for the cutter was only 40, while the regular 14 wooden clinker lifeboats can only fill 65. Lifeboat 1 actually does share the same davits as collapsible C and collapsible A which is actually stored up on top of the officer's quarters near the first funnel. And as we can see here, we have lifeboat number one, which is basically off to the side right here. We also have collapsible C, we also have collapsible A. Now, I know what you guys are going to be thinking. Why can't they just store this up on top of collapsible C? Well, the problem is for, for that is basically if you do that, you basically risk damaging collapsible C, and basically you really need to have that lifeboat in case of an emergency situation and damaging that lifeboat is just going to render it useless and basically it's not going to be any good. So now that we got the information out of the way, let's begin the story. On the night of April 14, 1912, the White Star Line's newest ocean liner, the RMS Titanic, was sailing through the North Atlantic Ocean. At 11.40 a.m., the ship would collide with an iceberg breaching six of the 16 watertight compartments. After observations and inspections carried out by the officers and Thomas Andrews on board, it is confirmed that Titanic will founder. Boarding of the lifeboats didn't start until 12.40 a.m., to which officers Murdoch and Lightoller oversaw the starboard and port sites respectively. The first few boats that were lowered away were only filled with less than half of what the lifeboats were supposed to be occupied with. At 12.45 a.m., the first rocket was fired up, but however, the firing of the rockets also interfered with lifeboat once since the boat is close to the proximity area to where the rockets were firing up. Now, the reason for the delay of lifeboat one was due to 4th Officer Joseph Vauxhall actually keeping back the passengers away from the bridge area of the ship while they were actually still firing off rockets. Basically, they were using the rockets to call the attention of any nearby ships. Around that time is the SS Californian. But don't worry, I will do a video about the Californian real soon. The reason for this is that the detonator would injure anyone standing too close to where the bulwark rail is located. Now, a 
bulwark rail is the angled railing of the ship near the bridge of the Titanic. But in this case, I actually do have a photo of the Olympic. It's bulwark rail. And basically, that's about as close as I can get for the Titanic anyway, whatsoever. Now, Sir Cosmo and Lady Lucy Duffcorn, along with her secretary, Laura, Laura Franken Cadelli, I'm sorry if I actually did mispronounce her name, they were actually staying near Lifeboat 1. Now, prior to this, Sir Cosmo actually pleaded with his wife, saying get in a boat. So basically that their secretary and his wife actually did refuse whatsoever. Another passenger by the name of Charles Stengel already did saw his wife, Mrs. Anna May he Stengel, which was actually sent off into lifeboat number 5, to which says she would survive later on. He watched the loading process of lifeboat number 3, and actually moved forward to reach number 1, to which he actually did encounter the Duff Gordons and their secretary as well. Now, given the location on where they were at that time, it was actually incredibly dark, that the Stengel can hardly make out any faces, any human forms in the boat whatsoever. So he approached First Officer William Murdoch and asked if he think he can get in. And Murdoch just simply replied, jump in. A New York businessman by the name of Abraham Salomon asked Murdoch if he can board, and Murdoch actually did say, yeah, go ahead. And Salomon actually did join the Duff Garden Party in Stengel. Seven crew members were also on board this lifeboat as well. So now we have a, a demographic of five first class passengers and seven of the uh, crew members that actually did work down below the ship. Which is basically you got five firemen, five stokers, and also you got two of the able bodied seamen, which one of them is actually George Simon, who was actually put in charge by First, first Officer William Murdoch. Once the lifeboat was filled with only 12 occupants, lifeboat 1 was lowered into the water, making this one of the fewest occupied lifeboats to be lowered to the North Atlantic Ocean. But why the few numbers, you may ask? Well, in a nutshell, Murdoch and Lowe cleared out the front starboard section, and they didn't seek out the passengers due to lifeboat 1 being close to where the water is, and they had to get the lifeboat off and make room before setting up classical seat. However, the process of lowering the lifeboat did not go as incident-free whatsoever, as during the lowering, a protuberance was coming out of the Titanic's hole called a spar, which is basically a wiring guy and a painter, as the lifeboat was lowering away. Something on the boat caught the spar and prevented the boat from lowering further down, so therefore it was stuck for a while as crew members raced to find a tool to free the lifeboat. They did find a pair of wire cutters, and surprisingly, it did work. Lifeboat 1 would go down to the ocean without any further incident, but once they finally touched down, crew members were told by First Officer Murdoch to stand off a little way and come back when called. As they row away from the Titanic, at this time the second row of portholes under Titanic's nameplate started to submerge a little after 1.15 a.m., according to George Simons. Lady Duff Gordon recalls saying, Just beside us was a man setting off rockets, and the ear-splitting noise added to the horror of being suspended in the midair while one of the lowering ropes got caught and was only released after what seemed to be interminable time. Afterwards, Murdoch and his men began to move aft, as 5th Officer Lowe, who actually noticed a large crowd of male passengers, were starting to congregate at the aft port boats and started to get unruly. It's the moment where order is about to break down and Lowe proceeds to move to the aft port side. The occupants of Lifeboat 1 did nothing to go back to the ship to pick up more passengers as no order was given out except to row 200 yards away from the ship and stay until they were called upon. They had no other choice but to watch as the great liner went down underneath the North Atlantic Ocean at 2.20 a.m. in the morning and heard nothing but the screams of thousands of passengers as they were slowly succumbing to the 28-degree water. Now, the one event that actually did forever link the controversy of Lifeboat 1, it didn't take place until after the ship sank, so a man in a lifeboat by the name of Charles Hendrickson tried to convince the Duffgorns to go back to the sinking site to pick up passengers that are actually slowly dying in the ocean. A crew member by the name of Charles Hendrickson proposed taking Lifeboat 1 back to the site of the disaster to rescue the ones dying in the ocean. He testified saying that Lady Duffgorn herself said they should not go back due to the fears of the lifeboat being swamped, to which became a deleted scene in the James Cameron 1997 movie 
but it was cut due to the similarity with the following scene with Molly Brown in Lifeboat 6. When Lady Duffgorn testified, she denied everything. She said that Hendrickson never made a proposal or a conversation happen on this lifeboat. However, the rest of the crew backed up her claim, and the testimony from Charles Hendrickson came back and haunt the Duff Gordons. At 3 a.m., a crew member by the name of Robert Pusey actually did overheard a conversation between Lucy and Macy, I mean, not Macy, uh, Mabel, excuse me, saying, oh, there's your beautiful nightdress, gone. So, upon hearing that... Robert actually did got ticked off and basically snapped at the women saying, never mind that you, you have your own lives. And the, me and the other sailors on here, we just lost everything. We even lost our wages as well. Now for further context behind that is basically what he was talking about was basically a old board of trade regulation saying that if you, you were employed on board a ship or an ocean liner, and if it goes down underwater, you basically lost your pay or your or your pay stops. So upon hearing this, Sir Cosmo actually did felt bad for the men that actually lost everything on board the Titanic. So he decided that he was going to help them out by writing a check to each of the seven crew members on there, five British pounds. Now, you got to think about this. Not really a lot of money, but it actually really did was actually very helpful in him doing that whatsoever. And he was actually very true to his word when the Carpathia actually did came to pick up the survivors. But if you think that was actually the rightful thing to do, there was actually a huge rude awakening for Sir Cosmo Duff Gordon whatsoever. At 4 a.m., the Cunard Line steamer Carpathia arrived at the Titanic disaster site to take on the passengers. Lifeboat 1 was the second lifeboat to approach the Cunard ship. For four and a half hours, Carpathia took on the 705 survivors of the disaster. Upon boarding, the ones that were in Lifeboat 1 were gathered for a group photo and they were sent on their way. So basically, rumors started spreading around about why Lifeboat 1 was actually lowered with very few people on board and the lack of their actions that night at the Seagate. Questioning why the boat did not go back and why very few were there were on board and the actions of the Duff Gordon family also on board as well. So newspaper companies were actually very aware and actually did start publishing articles about the rumors. Now not certain how because I can't speculate because I got no evidence to back a, up any claim whatsoever. They became aware of the five pound gift that Sir Cosmo gave to the crew members since they lost their wages. So Newspapers started spreading misinformation and yellow journalism, which is basically taken elements of truth, twisted up to create a lie. Saying that it was his fault that Life at One did not go back to the rescue that was from the water, thus, you know, given the uh, nickname the Millionaire's Lifeboat or the Money Boat. And heck, when they got back to England after giving their testimony in the uh, Senate Titanic inquiry, there's even a newspaper boy that shouted out, read about the Titanic coward on a placard reading, Baronet and wife rode away from the drowning and Sir Cosmo Duff Gorin safe and sound while women actually did go down on the Titanic. The newspaper says that the five pounds that Sir Cosmo gave to the crew as a gift was a bribe, saying that he bribed the sailors from going back to rescue those stranded in the water. Now, there's no evidence in case of this bribe whatsoever. And this actually did destroy the reputation of Sir Cosmo Duff Gordon. So you got Sir Cosmo Duff Gordon, who was actually trying to defend himself. Newspaper companies did what they did. And like I said, they did the same thing to Bruce Ismay. Took elements of truth, twisted it up just to sell a lie. Now, if you actually look at both men, Sir Cosmo Duff Gordon and J. Bruce Ismay, look at their situations. It's very, very different with each other. Ismay didn't do anything wrong, but then again, what he did actually didn't make himself look good, to which I will actually cover that in a video real soon. What they actually do both have in common is actually they were both made villains by the media. So Sir Cosmo and his wife, Lucy Duff, were actually called to testify in the Senate Titanic inquiry hearings in the United States, and it actually created a huge buzz and was actually was one of the most viewed inquiries outside. The public was actually so caught up 
about the scandal and that many people actually did show up outside the day the Duffgorns came to testify. Sir Cosmo was actually asked, you know, various questions about his side of the story. And the Senate actually did rule that the rumors in the stories were actually very unfounded. And the report stated, and I'm going to quote this, the very gross charges against Sir Cosmo Duffgorn that having got into number one boat, he bribed the men in it to row away from the drowning people is unfounded. They try to clear up his name, but... Then again, you have to think about this. Sir Cosmo Duffgorn's reputation actually never recovered whatsoever. And for the rest of his life, his actions were completely brand If you remember Mr. George Simons, he gave his testimony in the U.S. inquiry to Senator Perkins, saying there was no other incident that he wished to state that he would be of interest to the public. And the ruling that, that number one, should have at least gone back to pick up more survivors. Now, you have to think about it. Twelve people occupied the boat, and basically... 40 can occupy it. In the aftermath of the scandal, what happened to Lifeboat 1 is the same for 13 out of the 20 lifeboats. They were brought back to New York on the Carpathia. Four of the regular and collapsible lifeboats were set adrift. Infamously, collapsible A was found a month later by the RMS Oceanic. People stripped lifeboats of the nameplates as a souvenir, but they had been returned to the White Star Line. Some lifeboats were either destroyed or repurposed for the RMS Olympic. So the story of lifeboat number one was basically a case of yellow journalism and ruining the reputation of one passenger and hopefully we're, we cannot see this situation again in the future. So it had to be a very uneventful evening but actually turned into a controversial lifeboat in the entire story. The only reason why because uh, the media actually published misinformation or yellow journalism or didn't get any facts straight and rushed to public a story just so quick thus destroying the reputation of someone who actually did nothing wrong whatsoever. You know, you always want to double check everything, and you always want to fact check everything, and even today, stuff like this still happens all the time. Whenever you work for the media, you know, it's always important to fact check everything, double check before publishing hopefully something like what happened to Sir Cosmo Duffcorn actually does not happen again in the future. So whether accounts actually did differ, it is likely that the truth will never be known. And I think that will be all for this video anyway. So if you uh, like this video, leave a like, comment on here, subscribe for more of these historical videos. I will try to do more in the very near future whatsoever. I really like the fact that how this actually did turn out real well. So if you want more Titanic related videos, you know, let me know and I can make it happen. So... Once again, my name's Dustin, and I will see you guys in another video.